Welcome to the first edition of the Indie Mayhem Show. Uh, very excited to do this, this first uh, spin-off. I, I guess not counting the hangouts that we've been doing here. Uh, we want to talk independent wrestling with people on the show that want to talk about independent wrestling. No more curmudgeons on this show. <laughs> well, okay, maybe some of our guests might be. Uh, but, uh, of course, here with me is Eamon Payton. Join me from, uh, wait, wait, are you back in San Antonio or still in Corpus, Corpus Christi, Corpus Texas? Christi, for one, Texas. The one rare episode of the Indie Mayhem yes, show while being Corpus Christi. the annual rare episode from the uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. This is the first time and the last time you'll ever see this background, probably. So I get you, rid of like, the, I thought you like, get used to the niceness. I thought you installed a nice curtain. It reminds me of old Johnny Carson. Yeah, it looks there. nice. It's not going to stay that way for yeah, long. I just dated uh, myself. May I, also, uh, may I also note that Sword just used a really big word, and pulling back the curtain, he couldn't say inaugural to start off the show. It's so cold there we down go. here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a polar vortex, damn it. Um, and this is all brick. <laughs> uh, but so yeah. Uh, yeah, the... This is, um, this is sort of a uh, spin-off, I guess you could say, from the uh, regular Wrestling Mayhem show. It is. Um, to talk about independent wrestling, uh, we had the Indie Minute on the Wrestling Mayhem show, but I think that with um, sort of this podcast, we'll be able to get into a bit deeper discussions, get to talk more about sort of the all the entity that is independent wrestling. Uh, I know me and Sorg will be doing this primarily and we'll have sort of be, both me and him have very different perspectives perspectives. If you don't know, Sorg uh, runs Sorgatron media, which is a company that produces DVDs for a lot of great independent wrestling companies in Pittsburgh, like you know, IWC, RWA, and he's worked for various other companies all throughout PA and Ohio. Uh, I am the play by play announcer for a little company called inspire pro wrestling, uh, out of uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, so we got those two different perspectives we're always surrounded with independent wrestling we're you know immersed in it constantly uh and we're just going to talk and we're going to have discussions we're going to have people on to sort of uh just get get into the discussion about independent wrestling and and all things about it so yes and of course if you want uh, any information about this is of, of course uh still uh, uh, under the umbrella of the wrestling mayhem show you can find out about this episode and everything else we're doing over at wrestlingmayhemshow.com uh, you can find, uh, we're going to get this episode uh, here after we get it done up on iTunes. We're going to get it on St Stitcher, uh, YouTube, and a bunch of other places for video and audio as well. And, of course, you can follow us at Mayhem Show on Twitter. Uh, you can drop us a line, uh, the same email as before, goodtimesatwrestlingmayhemshow.com. Please uh, uh, put in the subject line, Indie, so we can separate it out for the show. Uh, and, of course, you can also still drop a hotline, uh, 412-206-WMS0. Uh, and of course, and of course, thanks. Our intro, great new intro there uh, from uh, Basic Lovely Sickness. Uh, you can check him out, basicsickness.com. Go download it. His stuff is for free, guys. Uh, support some uh, indie music for the indie wrestling. Uh, and, and of course, Pittsburgh based here as well. So, uh, one big thing, Eamon, uh, uh, you know, we talked about this. We wanted to make sure uh, this is going to be a very uh, interview focused show. Mm -hmm, uh, absolutely. Uh, you and I, we have a lot of, uh, uh, of I can't want to call them connections. I don't want to make <laughs> it sound that big or anything. We're big, important people, we, sort Yeah, yeah, on. sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, and, and our first guest is definitely going to disagree with me on that. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so joining us this week, uh, our first guest, thank you for being our guinea pig of sorts and digging out the uh, 1998, 1998 webcam to join us here. Uh, Joe Dombrowski, uh, announcer extraordinary. You can see him. Uh, he's been on Ring of Honor pay-per-views and, and, and TV and IWC and Prime Wrestling. And I, I can't even begin. What, what do you tell people when, you, when, when they ask what all you do in pro wrestling, Joe? Um, I usually just direct them to my Facebook page. Uh, that's a little easier. But greetings from the past uh, uh, and, and my Circa 2005 technology. And, uh, you know, thank you for, for making me your guinea pig. And if it all fails, then I assume full responsibility. Perfect. Perfect. That, that's exactly why I picked you. Um, <laughs> and, of course, uh, Joe, uh, Joe and I, uh, we, we do a lot of work in full disclosure here, but I do want to talk about that a little bit as well here. Uh, we've been uh, uh, writing a bit for, uh, for, you know, a lot of the IWC shows. Uh, helped out uh, here and there for uh, Prime Wrestling, and we've got uh, this year was monumental, and 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 I know you have an even more monumental post you did on Facebook, but amongst that was some productions I'm very proud of uh, from this year, including the uh, the, the 
recent refereeing 101 with Jimmy Corderas that was just released, which is doing very well. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people seem to be very receptive to that. And of course, the controversial Montreal theory, sir. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, because I mean, I, I just edited the thing. I just pointed a camera, you know, in the long run. You're the brainstorm behind that whole thing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how, why was that a thing that you wanted to do? Um, I had always been very intrigued by conspiracy theories and uh, uh, very pragmatic thinkers that question the status quo and question um, the norms of society that, that are being fed to you, whether it be from a political standpoint, a religious standpoint, um, you know, very inspired by, by guys like Jesse Ventura and Bill Maher and Penn Jillette. Um, who really came out and, and, and spoke their mind, even if it wasn't, you know, the, what society wanted you to believe. Um, and I figured if there was a way to apply that to wrestling, um, it'd be a very unique, untapped kind of market with that. And uh, I'd always been very intrigued by the Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Vince McMahon, uh, Montreal Screwjob uh, uh, saga. And I had never thought too deeply about the Montreal situation until I had heard um, Steve Carino at one point uh, tell some people he didn't believe that Mon the Montreal screw job was actually a screw job. He thought that Brett was secretly involved in it. And, you know, I'd never thought of it that way. And it was always in the back of my mind. Um, and, and, and finally, around 2009 or so, uh, I was re-watching Wrestling with Shadows, and I just watched Bill Maher's Religious. Um, I was watching Jesse Ventura's Conspiracy Theory. It was about to premiere. Um, and kind of this perfect storm came uh, in my mind. And I thought to myself, you know, nobody has told this potential story that could be out there. Um, you know, look at people like Michael Moore, which as, as polarizing as Michael Moore is, um, you know, he goes out there and tries to find the story that everybody else is afraid to talk about. Um, if there's if there is a story like that in pro wrestling without being tasteless, um, that's this. So I wanted to go out there and, and stir some things up and ask some questions nobody was asking and and. Uh, above all else, make people think because hopefully people can look at how in just a few hours we can create this whole potential alternate reality of what Montreal was so we thought and what it maybe could have been in reality beneath the surface. If people can take that line of thinking and apply it to their everyday lives, um, that could actually help with some major problems and some major issues in the real world. So I wanted to entertain. I wanted to make people think I wanted to make people talk and, and humbly speaking, I think I accomplished that. Definitely. Uh, you, you definitely got some interesting responses uh, from what I've been hearing. Uh, what, uh, tell me what, what, what's the most surprising response you've gotten from this project? Um, the most, one of the most surprising things to me was, uh, really pitching the idea to, to, to people within the wrestling industry, mm -hmm. uh, both before production and after production, because you really get a sense of how um, divided the issue is. And of course, we can discuss it in fun because um, nobody was actually hurt from the issue, and, and, and obviously we weren't directly offended, uh, affected by it. Um, you know, the fact that I'll come up to some people and, 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 and tell them the concept, and they'll say, you know, you really believe that? Are you kidding me? And um, other people will say, you know, well, of course that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've had people who, who, who say there's no way Brett could have known, and people say there's no way Brett could have not known. And these are all very highly intelligent, respected people in our business. Um, but they all see it a different way. And, and just walking around at WrestleCon uh, last April, uh, WrestleMania weekend in New Jersey, and being able to talk to some of the people about it um, and, and, and have some very favorable response. And, oh, that's interesting. And, oh, I'd like to see it. And, oh, I always thought about that. And here's my theory and, and, and stuff like that. And, and 
Consequently, guys I would pitch in pre-production, hey, would you like to be a part of this? Oh, no, I don't want that kind of heat. Oh, no, that's not my kind of thing. Um, you know, some people love it. Some people are scared of it. Some people uh, uh, have, have their own theory. Some people think it's completely preposterous. Um, you know, it, it's no one reaction. It's just the variety of reactions I've gotten and continue to get. Definitely. And we, we, there's a great series. I, I love that we, we did this at uh, WrestleCon. Uh, uh, you went around and got other people's takes on the theory. I uh, hear we're showing a video that we've been uh, pushing around here on the network with Bill After, actually, you had a chance to talk to uh, and stuff like that that people can go check out. And, and you get a lot of comments, too, for this stuff, too. We absolutely do. And I actually saw Bill the, uh, the other week at, uh, at Extreme Rising. And, and Bill came up to me, and, and his remark was he was surprised at, at how much traffic our interview had gotten. He was mm -hmm. very pleasantly surprised by that. So, um, you know, just goes to show that the interest continues to grow. But we talked to Bill after, who, who introduced Andy Kaufman to Jerry Lawler. So he has his, uh, uh, his hands in, in, in past wrestling uh, uh conspiracies and hoodwinking so to speak uh talk to blue meanie who's a big documentary fan uh talk to pj Polacco, just incredible who was part of the click very close with sean michaels very close with triple h um you know we talked to paul london we didn't accomplish anything but it was really fun um <laughs> that's right and 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 uh uh you know, having a chance to uh, talk to Johnny Gargano and Sammy Callahan and, and guys like that. Um, I talked to Jimmy Corderas uh, uh, on the internet a, a few weeks ago. It's at MontrealTheory.com. We got Jimmy's take on it, and Jimmy was one of the referees there in Montreal. Uh, just goes to show you, everybody has an opinion, and I would say there are at least easily uh, another half dozen guys that had very vocal opinions on the topic that uh, uh, either we didn't have time to get on camera or, or weren't comfortable getting on camera. Uh, so I won't reveal them specifically, but these are names just as big, if not bigger than the ones we put online. Um, and, 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 and who knows, hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to have some of them talk someday soon. Uh, because the, the thing about Montreal theory is, is this isn't something that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. You know, 50 years later, we're still, we're still debating what happened to John F. Kennedy. Uh, uh, you know, we're still debating what, what really happened on the moon. Um, you know, wrestling fans will always debate Montreal and always discuss Montreal, and hopefully, Montreal Theory will become, uh, uh, you know, a companion piece to, to Wrestling with Shadows or Survivor Series '97. Yeah, uh, I, uh, you, I was going to say uh, you mentioned Jimmy Corderas, uh, and that kind of ties into the new project that you have working on now, uh, Refereeing One Hundred and One, which is something I'm actually very interested in. Uh, I, was, I actually talked to Sorg like in conversation about how uh, the thing I've noticed is that. Um, a lot of cases when you see, at least on the independent level, with referees, um, it's a lot of times it's somebody that's, you know, sort of a wrestler in training who's sort of doing this to circumvent, um, you know, before becoming an actual pro wrestler. And you see very few actual, like, people dedicated to, you know, being, you know, referees and just being referees. But it's interesting to have that perspective out there, I think, of this is what you need to do to be good at your job. And to be great at your job, was that sort of the inspiration that you got from, you know, doing this project or did it come from somewhere else? Uh, I think referees don't get the respect they deserve. Hmm. Um, objectively speaking, announcers don't get the respect they deserve. Cameramen don't get the respect they deserve. Um, because a lot of these hack fly-by-night promoters, um, they get... They, they, they get wrestling, but they don't really get wrestling. Um, you know, they sometimes don't understand that it takes more than um, two skilled wrestlers to make the overall wrestling presentation. You need a referee to enforce rules and keep logic and psychology intact. You need an announcer to tell the story. You need someone behind the camera lens to document that. And, and so often, uh, a promoter will cut as many corners as possible, especially in those job titles. That's mm -hmm. where you get your free labor. That's where you get, um, you know, a promoter's buddies. That's where you get the people that will work for free and won't take time to devote to developing their craft and, and making themselves a commodity and making themselves valuable. Um, and that's a shame because that's disrespectful to the guys in the ring. 
that are sacrificing their body um, to, to make all their surroundings that much more difficult to, to paint their picture. And uh, I've noticed, you know, the Pittsburgh, Cleveland area has a few um, very good referees, mm -hmm. um, but nowhere near as many as when I started. Mm -hmm. um, and very few coming up the ranks. Uh, I, I actually was talking to one young ref uh, uh, this past weekend at PWX, and I asked him, um, is it your primary goal to be a long-term ref? And he said yes, and I was surprised, and I was pleased, and I felt like hugging the guy, because there's nobody <laughs> like him anymore. He's, he's, he's right. a dying, you know, mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to shine a light on the fact that there are a lot of job titles in wrestling that go overlooked, uh, sometimes by design, but are just as important in creating the overall spectrum. So when the opportunity came to work with Jimmy and do something that had never really been done before, never been done, period, uh, uh, in the United States, and never done on DVD, period, to my knowledge, um, I wanted to do that because not only do you give people a perspective that they don't normally think about, but now we have a chance to help the business as a whole by spreading a lot of positive guidance where there really isn't a lot because let's face it, how many veteran refs 15, mm. 20 plus years do you see on the Indies actively helping the young guys out? We had a chance to fill that void with Jimmy and, and I think Jimmy did a fantastic job. Excellent. And, and very uh, educational. Like I remember you know, sitting there watching that thing. It, I learned a lot about pro wrestling, you know, from, 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 from observing all that too. Yeah, it's very educational. It's something that uh, um, if you're a wrestler, if you're a, 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 a promoter, um, you know, even if you're a nosy fan, you know, I, I hope you watch this. I hope you watch this because <laughs> um, you'll gain an appreciation and a respect uh, for that job. And if you're working with a referee, you'll learn how to use a referee uh, 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 to work with you and not against you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, hopefully this will be just the first in a series for us with, with, with various seminars and educational type things, but uh, a great way to start. And, you know, Jimmy was around for 22 years in WWE. There's no one he hasn't worked with. There's nothing he hasn't seen. Um, and, and he can provide so much. And if I'm a wrestler, if I'm uh, uh, anybody that wants to work in this business, I want to see this so I know and I can fully appreciate what it is a referee does. Uh, now, of course, you know, uh, it, it sounds like, uh, and I don't know how much you want to talk about future projects here, but uh, it, it, you're, you seem to be doing a, be, a bit of a pivot here from just being an announcer in wrestling, and of course you, you've had uh, a couple positions as, as a booker as well, uh, to kind of producing something uh, a bit more uh, independently. Is this uh, kind of looked at as a pivot on your part? Um, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a pivot. I'd call it an expansion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I have no intentions of leaving the broadcast table, no intentions of leaving a microphone, but I think there's a definite untapped market for certain projects. Obviously there's a lot of great shoot interviews and a lot of great specialty DVDs out there. Um, you know, at, at the heart of it, I love to tell stories. I love to, uh, 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 produce content, um, circumstances uh, uh, presented itself where prime wrestling really wasn't that viable of an option for me to do that anymore. And I'm sure we'll get into that later. Um, but Montreal theory was and Montreal theory was a, was a big eye opener to me uh, that, Hey, this stuff at some level is supposed to be fun. Um, mm. And I had more fun telling everybody the story of the Montreal theory than I had doing anything else in years. And the, the contacts I made and, and the buzz I was able to create and the shocking amount of attention that it received um, really told me, hey, I'm, I'm probably headed in the right direction here. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of potential here to be successful and to, uh, to make that viewer feel something, to make that viewer feel. Um, 
no matter what that emotion is. Uh, so honestly, between, uh, you know, original projects and between the prime wrestling video library, there's probably 15 or 20 projects swirling around in my head mm -hmm. that hopefully we'll get to in the next couple of years. Um, and I will, I will much like with prime wrestling, much like with myself as an announcer, I will keep doing it until I sense that, uh, uh, it won't work or I'm not wanted anymore. And then I'll move on to the next thing. But, but I'm loving what I'm doing right now. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, you know, very well, and, uh, I won't get into too big a specifics yet, but, I, I, you know, it's been mentioned publicly a time or two. So I have no problem alluding to it. You know, we're going to be telling Zach Gowan's life story, uh, coming up this spring. And, mm -hmm. and to me, that's the greatest story in wrestling. Uh, cause you've got a guy who, lived three or four lives before he turned 30. He's a professional wrestler. He's a cancer survivor. He is a, 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 a recovering drug addict. He is a movie stuntman. He's a motivational speaker. He's a husband. He's a father. Um, what hasn't this guy done? Honestly. Um, and we've heard bits and pieces of his story here and there, but nobody's been able to to properly shine that light on him. And I think Zach is, as a commodity, the most underrated thing, maybe the most underrated thing in wrestling right now. It shocks me there is not a, a, a national or global company utilizing him more. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully shining that light on him this spring will change that. But uh, that's just the latest and what will hopefully be a, a further line uh, uh, there on out of, of, of cool things to present to you people, including some things in my head I haven't told you about, Mr. Sorg, so we'll have to talk oh, soon no. off air. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, that's usually at least some fun stuff. Um, you mentioned earlier, I, and I guess we should probably uh, at least uh, uh, mention that uh, momentarily here. Uh, of course, Prime Wrestling, you, you recently came out uh, with some details about exactly what was happening with Prime. I, I think most people speculated uh, that that last resolution was going to be, uh, at least for the time being, the last show. Um, is there, uh, of course, you know, it was uh, uh, issues more with, the, I think, the television station, it sounds like, than anything else. Um, you were uh, behind the scenes pretty much, you know, Booker, I guess we can call showrunner. I know you were the guy with the stopwatch uh, there during most of those productions that I had the, the fortune to be a part of. Um that seemed to, was was that one of the bigger endeavors that you've taken so far here in pro wrestling? For six years, that was um, the center of my wrestling universe. Was Prime Wrestling or or Pro Wrestling Ohio before that? Uh, I, I was very proud to be a part of it because it gave me my first big opportunity to spread my wings on the creative end and be more involved in, in storytelling um, because. Watching independent wrestling, uh, and uh, uh, you know, maybe this may not be the best thing to say on the inaugural inaugural <laughs> indie wrestling podcast, but a lot of indie wrestling sucks. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, yes. But I think, and, no, I think it's important to have that discussion and have that you know comparison that you know a lot. Uh, you know, there's a good majority out there that isn't always that great. Mm -hmm. And being an indie wrestling announcer inevitably I will wind up on some of those shows that suck mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> not necessarily suck as a blanket statement, but maybe you have great talent and no direction. Maybe you have great direction and no budget for talent. May, you know, there, there's different factors that go into that. So if I have a show that I'm broadcasting and the talent is subpar or the promoter is, is, is green as grass, as the expression goes, and they re they really don't get on some level that this match needs to tell a story, that there need to be characters accomplishing a goal here. I have to make stuff up, not mm -hmm. not maliciously, but I have to logically fill in the blanks as I I feel should be filled in as to what is trying to be attained. Um, that's how I fell in love with booking wrestling. You know, I figured out how to fill in the pieces as I went, so why not paint the whole picture? Um, and, and, and I had a chance to do a little bit of that in England with 1PW back in the, the, the mid-2000s. 
Um, but but PWO was really my first chance to do that with a very young uh, crop of talent. Um, you know, twenty year old Johnny Gargano, a twenty year old Gregory Iron. Um, you know, uh, Matt Justice. Um, you know, guys that have grown on uh, uh, to, to, to do really good things uh, just in their infancy. Um, and, and in time, that job became too big. Um, you know, you talked about the biggest thing. It became too big because I'm one person. I live in Pittsburgh uh, uh, and I'm doing TV out of Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And when circumstances present themselves where I don't have that support system. I don't have that help on the promoting end, on the advertising end, on a TV production end, whatever the case was. When one part of the machine starts to falter, um, I, there's, there's a chain reaction. Um, and and it, there came to be a point where I was calling venues and booking dates. I was talking to sponsors to try to get money. I was negotiating with charities. I had to go out and buy and file insurance. I I was doing um, the lion's share of promoting in addition to booking the shows. And anybody who knows me has worked with me. I'm very meticulous with booking shows. Every match, every segment has to make sense, has to have purpose. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of detail into it. So to do that, which by itself is pretty overwhelming, um, uh, on top of being a promoter, which I never wanted to do, I told myself I made a promise from day one. I would never be a promoter, and I would never put my own money into wrestling. And I broke both those promises to myself. Uh, but because I did it with good reason because I believed in the product. Um, and I believed in our platform of of sports time ohio you know regional cable tv sports network um and i believed in our guys um unfortunately the weight kept mounting on my shoulders um the financial situation became a burden to me and uh, uh in july of 2013 uh Fox Sports Network, which had bought the, the, the station six months earlier, got their new people and policies in place, and they wanted to hit us with a bill for insurance that would more than double our annual budget for producing TV. Um, you know, I, I, I knew then there needed to be a change. And, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, there was nobody to pick up the slack. Um from a promotions end, from a financial end, you know, I, there were points I was having panic attacks because I had so much stress on me. Um, and, and I was doing three or four different people's jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I'm not trying to put the heat on anybody else. We were always understaffed, but as health issues, money issues, uh, personal issues, professional issues, whatever set in, uh, it always seemed like there was something pulling somebody away, and I was the only one to step in. Um, mm-hmm. And it became it became a, 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 a you know a, a negative to my health, my mental health, my physical health. I put on twenty pounds of stress weight. Um, I, I knew something had to change, um, and when the insurance thing came, I knew you know for better or worse, this was the change. This hurdle, I can't jump. If somebody can come along and and jump that hurdle with me, I'm there. But I, I can't deplete my bank account and deplete my sanity just for an extra six months of shows or 12 months of shows. So mm-hmm. some hard decisions had to be made. And, and, and that's when Resolution 6 became, in all likelihood, the final show. And, and I will say um, we had a hell of a last chapter, and I'm very proud of it. And, and from day one, one of my worries was I'm going to put a lot – I'm going to put my life into this. And something's going to happen where I, I walk out bitter or angry. But thankfully, I was able to, to be completely proud of that show 
and the guys that were there from the Garganos and the Irons and the M Dogs that had been there from day one to the Rhinos and the Zach Gallons and the Paul Londons and, and everywhere in between, I was able to look at that show and 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 walk out with my head held high, knowing that we ended it with dignity and class, uh, uh, as much dignity and class as you'll find in pro wrestling. Uh, we made it happen and and you know we left those people with a smile maybe a bittersweet smile but a smile nonetheless hmm. definitely it's definitely going to be missed uh i definitely lo- always look forward to going up to those shows um so let's dial it back a little bit let's you know we talked about you know some of the stuff uh it's exciting you now some of the stuff that, that maybe you're not quite so excited about now uh let's talk about um because if you're if you're in pro wrestling, if you're working in it, especially with indie wrestling and everything, you you got to be a fan. Like I, I I think you know that gets overlooked a little bit. People can become bitter about one thing or another. Uh, so I want to kind of go back a little bit for you, Joe. Uh, uh, tell us like why why wrestling? I guess like maybe what was the first thing that got you into it? Was the thing that hooked you? Um, ironic you asked that because I literally just saw a photo online the other day of my earliest memory uh of watching pro wrestling and i can't i don't even know when it happened sometime in either 1990 or 1991 i don't really know the context outside of the obvious that they were feuding but i remember andre the giant um doing an interview with gene overland i think it was when they did the uh the platform interviews back in the day and and Andre is stepping on the hand of Bobby the Brain Heenan. <laughs> and I don't know that that was my first memory of wrestling, but I, I, it's one of my first memories in life. I remember flipping through the channels and seeing Andre's hand on Bobby Heenan's hand, or Andre's foot on Bobby Heenan's hand, and Heenan just writhing in pain. And I was like, huh, well, that's something. <laughs> and, and, and then it builds from there. I, I can't explain what hooked me. Bobby Heenan hooked me. I don't know. Uh, um, and and I must have been at the oldest five. Um, and from there was uh, my first videotape, my first magazine. Uh, this was all around the time of WrestleMania seven. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and it just built from there. I think I was. You know, I was a good kid, but I kind of, I was a quiet kid kept to myself. I didn't really have that fantasy world to immerse myself in. But when wrestling came along, like, here's something to dive in head first and get lost in. Um, and by the time Ric Flair won the 1992 Royal Rumble, forget about it. Uh, <laughs> It, it was all said and done. And if there's a reason I'm an announcer today, if there's anything in my childhood, there's a reason I'm an announcer today. It's a 1992 Royal Rumble. I remember, you know, being seven or eight years old and with my having my action figures and I would do the commentary, but I wouldn't be me. I'd be Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan. And I would sit there all day and argue with myself. You know, I'm, sure i'll tell it to a therapist one day and it'll open up a lot of doors but that's what i did that explains a lot yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah and now now thankfully i have actual humans to argue with and and feel superior over so it comes full circle <laughs> there you go. um and we sort of you know talk about like how you get into wrestling one thing i want to talk about with people uh, that we have on this show uh, and i'm very curious to hear your story is um is how they got their break sort of in uh wrestling um, because, uh, I know like my story is very like happenstance of how I got involved. Um, and I've heard like a lot of similar sort of stories, but I was curious, I was just curious to wondering like who sort of gave you your break and how did it sort of like come about? I, I get asked a lot, you know, how do I get, you know, uh, I really like wrestling and I, 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 not, you know, athletic enough to wrestle. How do I become an announcer? How do I become a booker? How do I become a manager? How do I, um, And really, there's no answer for that. Like, first of all, if you want to become a booker or a writer or whatever you want, and you're not in wrestling, just stop. Just stop and punch yourself in the face. (laughs) Because you need minimum five years experience in wrestling to book or write anything. 
Uh, I mm. would say 10. Um, I only say five because I did it after five. But um, humbly speaking, I think I was an exception, not the rule. Um, uh, and not because I was anything special, but just because of timing. Um, people don't get that. That's people, you know, again, from the outside that think they get everything, but you don't. I, I used to be an expert before I got in the business. Then I got in the business, realized I didn't know anything. And right. then I started learning <laughs> for 11 years. Um, as an announcer, uh, I had always known I had wanted to be involved in uh, a, a wrestling but I was smart enough to know that, that I was completely unathletic. Um, didn't have the coordination. Um, didn't really have the guts to do it. Um, and I knew my gifts were, were always mental and verbal. Um, so I, I kind of had that plan, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. Um, in June of 2002... June or July, I, I heard uh, commercials on the radio for IWC Pro Wrestling. And I had heard of IWC before. Um, you know, I knew CM Punk worked there. I didn't really know who CM Punk was at the time, but I knew he worked there. I knew mm -hmm. Super Hentai was the best thing in Pittsburgh at the time. Uh, hottest commodity, biggest rising star. Um, I'd never seen a show. Um but I wanted to go to this show at the Isoplex at South Point in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, uh, where the Pittsburgh Penguins practice. Um, because that show was headlined by Jerry the King Lawler versus the Uganda giant Kamala. <laughs> I was sold. Freaking Kamala, man. How, how often do you get a chance to see him live in 2002? Um, I went to that show and, and I was mesmerized. Um, this is a point where, uh, my phone buzzes in the middle of a conversation interrupts me and, uh, it's, uh, Sorg tweeting about me. So that's very fitting. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it was so, it's such an intimate environment at that show. So up close and personal, and you had balls Mahoney there and, and little Guido Meritato, Joey Mercury, when he was still Joey Matthews teaming with Christian York, um, mm. You know, uh, I, I was blown away by the, the whole experience. And this is at a time when wrestling was very kind of depressing. WCW had just ended. ECW had just ended. WWE was, you know, their business was starting to slip. Uh, uh, they had just just done the draft, and they were trying to, 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 to build two credible rosters. Um, but IWC, man, that filled that void. IWC and, and a little bit of TNA, that, which was starting at the same time, really filled that void for me and exposed me to so much new talent. And, mm -hmm. and I knew right there, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a part of this and I was still in high school at the time. And, and lo and behold, three, four months later, um, my Spanish class needed a fundraiser. IWC was doing a fundraiser at the McKeesport high school on their schedule. So I put two and two together, and uh, I brought uh, Encon, Norm Connors, to town to, uh, to, to, to meet with some people from the school and set this up. And I kind of became a local uh, promoter and, and, and liaison, uh, however you say that, and uh, uh, put myself to work, pushing tickets, hanging posters, doing all the grunt work locally, while, of course, Norm did his thing online and with his normal fans. Um, Norm wanted to have local flavor on the show. Uh, uh, you know, we had a teacher that was a guest manager, you know, stuff like that. I was 17, so I couldn't really do anything really near the ring. Norm was afraid, I think, of the athletic commission coming down on him. Uh, justifiably so. Um, in mm -hmm. hindsight, I wouldn't have put me anywhere near there. Um, <laughs> I can't remember who suggested commentary. I want to say it was maybe me. Um, but I ended up sitting in with Jeff Gorman for, for almost all of the show. And uh, I don't mind saying that I was terrible on that show. I just <laughs> was completely awful. Um, but it got a foot in the door. Um, the next month, I was, I was back buying tickets. I was I, You know what? Hey, I lived my dream. If, if, if I never do anything else, I had that. I was able to, 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 to have a goal, set out to do it, and achieve it. 
Um, and maybe we'll have a chance to do it again. Maybe we'll bring a show back to my school in a few months. You know, who knows? So I was back to being a, a ticket paying fan and happy the next month. Um, until the end of that show, I get a tap on the, the shoulder. It's uh, referee Christopher Keeley Capella. I miss saying that name so much. Um, <laughs> it's a great name. And his real last name is Hill, so go figure. Anyway, um, <laughs> but he, he ran uh, uh, IWCWrestling.com at the time. This is before everybody realized that Jesse the Mark was a, 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 a wizard prodigy with everything. Um, Chris was running the site, and he was just sick of writing results. And I had written a few show results for, you know, uh, 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 the cheapo, barely a website website that I had, you know, tried to do something with to, to no success. Um, so Chris asked me to start writing the results. Um, and, and here, write these feature articles. Uh, hey, AJ Styles wants a shot at Colt Cabana's Super Indie title. Can you write about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I jumped into that you know, head first. Um, again, you know, the running theme, uh, and, and, and you guys from your observations, I'm sure, you know, talent's not the biggest thing in wrestling. It's, uh, it's luck and it's timing and it's connections. Um, mm -hmm. because two months after this, uh, Jeff Gorman, uh, the regular IWC announcer, uh, uh, I guess my mentor, um, had to go home and take care of his wife. His wife has a uh, uh, special need. She's in a wheelchair and she was having their first child. So Jeff took a couple months off by WC and I started bugging the crap out of Norm for another shot behind a mic. Cause now that I knew what it felt like, I thought I could do better. Mm -hmm. um, and granted, nobody said I was bad, but me, I'll put it that way. And I credit, <laughs> I credit Glenn Spector for giving me a lot of great encouragement uh, back in the day. He was the first guy that told me, I think you can do this. And, and that always stuck with me. Um, but I won another opportunity. Um, you know, Chuck Roberts was doing a lot of the play by play then with Eric ecstasy. Cause he had a broken leg. So I, you know, I'd sit in with, uh, uh, if one of them couldn't make it, I'd sit in for a match or two or when Gorman came back, I'd sit in for a match or two with them. And, you know, Norm would get the feedback. Um, until finally, uh, uh was August 23rd, 2003, Jeff Gorman couldn't make the show because he had um, a wedding to go to, I think. Chuck Roberts couldn't make the show. I think he had a wedding. I don't even know if it was the same wedding or not, but like, everybody couldn't be there. So uh, that was my first full show. Um, and that was that was the AJ versus Cabana show. Kurt Angle's brother was on the show. Shark Boy was on the show. Uh, it was Jimmy Jacobs and Alex Shelley's Pittsburgh debuts. Pretty big show. Mm. Um so I put my heart and soul into that show. I called it with Kingdom James. I had never met him before. Kingdom also did the ring announcing. For those that don't know Kingdom, he is uh, very articulate, uh, uh, sarcastic, uh, 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 great antagonistic color guy. Uh, uh, you know, old, former wrestler, former ring announcer with XPW. Um, you know, very easy to work with. Uh, that helped me exponentially. Um, but I put my heart and soul into that show. And looking back, watching it now, which I, I watched parts of it a few weeks ago for another project, um, some things I say make me cringe. Some of the way I deliver things make me cringe. But credit to Norm. He saw something. Um, and he, he shook my hand in the back. He said, that was effing awesome. And later in the night, he was on the phone with somebody, and he had remarked to them that he had a three-man announce team now with Gorman and Kingdom. And, nice. and it was working my way up. Uh, ever since. So I, I have to credit and thank Norm because I knew I had it in me. Uh, externally, I didn't have anything going for me. I had nothing impressive. All I, ha all I had was a belief that I could do it. And um, Norm saw that. And he gave me the opportunity. And I was appreciative enough of the opportunity and respectful enough of it to make sure out of respect to norm and the talent and the product um that i made the absolute most of it and i have not looked back since Excellent. awesome so tell me uh we got one more thing i think we need to address here um there watching your facebook uh and of course you know uh, uh, uh doing some traveling with you 
I understand. I've heard so much about your your love of KFC. <laughs> yeah. Um, is this I, the, is this the fuel of the next generation of announcer, Joe? Um, it's, I, it's better off that than than the next generation of wrestler. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I, I would. I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I um, food is my main vice. Um, you know, everybody has vices, everybody has weaknesses. I don't like when people judge others for their, oh, you do drugs, you're weak, you smoke, you're weak, whatever. We all have weaknesses, whether it's uh, gambling, whether it's food, whether it's sex, whether it's alcohol, smoking, whatever. Um, we all have something we give into when, when we need a fix. Um, luckily, mine aren't as unhealthy as some others. Um, I love KFC. I love Tim Hortons. Um, oh God! <laughs> big fan, big fan of the Dunkaroos by Betty Crocker until they they discontinued them in the U.S. And I'm on a mission to either get booked in Canada or get a Canadian friend booked in the U.S. so they can smuggle me some Dunkaroos. Um, I, I am openly taking applications to any Canadians listening for a Dunkaroo mule. That would like to <laughs> deliver them to me um, for a small gratuity and or potentially free DVDs or assorted other merchandise from my uh, 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 flea market of a merchandise table. Um, but I, I hate eating before shows, but after shows, I will get obnoxiously, morbidly obese on fried chicken, well done hamburgers uh, uh, and, and donut holes. And uh, it's a good release for me to either celebrate a great show or forget a terrible one um but uh i'm a big fan of uh of of indulging when the time is right but in moderation i if i make more than one trip to the colonel um you know one more than once a month i, I get very uh, uh guilty and self-conscious um but you know what uh uh, uh you know kfc's been uh um it's been very good to me you know uh me, me, and Paul London still talk about the eleven herbs and spices because that was one of our one of our bonding points in Jersey. Of course, he yeah. can't eat KFC because he has the gluten free thing, which I think makes him inferior to me. But that's another story. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I love to get fat. That's that's why I said earlier twenty pounds of stress from booking wrestling. That's why, you know, it's, hey, thank God my habit wasn't uh, something worse. Who knows what shape I'd be in. But, exactly. uh, yeah, anybody that's on the road with me, if you'd like to bring me a bucket of fried chicken uh, or, or pull in the drive-thru, you will have my uh, uh, everlasting gratuity. He's been, he's been known to request KFC as a rider in the contract. Yeah, that, yeah. that is a stipulation in the fine print, um, what, which I, I understand you have a very shrewd lawyer that's blocked that out for most of the contract negotiations. Yes. And yes. I'm, I'm still working on that. I think I, I thought I had negotiated down to some really good uh, uh, baked cookies, but I, I, I don't even think that was included <laughs> in the last deal. So I have I have to review my no, uh, my no, negotiating. The last shrewdness. deal, I want to make clear, the last deal I introduced you to Timbits. Um, no, that yeah, that was true. You you completely ruined my health for the rest of my life. Um, and then and then like you guys travel north and you don't bring any Timbits back to me. And Zach Gowan will come hang out for a weekend. He won't bring me any Timbits. And it's it's like you guys don't bake me cookies anymore. And it's like I just feel like I'm being used. I feel like this is a one way relationship. I feel like. You know, I'm I'm just I'm 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 being walked over, and and that's not cool. I mean, what happened to the love? Where's the love at, man? Well, we'll work on the love here. We'll work on the love here. That's all I ask, man. Just you know, love one another, you know. man. Peace, love, and pile drivers. That's what I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, we're gonna get into some conversation. We're gonna catch up here with Eamon and uh, talk about some wrestling coming up here uh, all across the country. But uh, tell everybody uh, where can they find uh, th all things Joe Dabrowski. Uh, you can find me on the Twitter machine, uh, at Joe underscore Dombrowski, D-O-M-B-R-O-W-S-K-I. Uh, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Joe Dombrowski Wrestling. Uh, my YouTube channel is Mr. Joe Dombrowski, because everything without the, uh, excuse me, anything without the prefix was already taken. Damn you people out there that share my name. Um, and you can go on YouTube and 
see the trailers to Montreal Theory and Refereeing 101 and some of the interviews I did, uh, the time Johnny Organo and I went to a gay bar, uh, the time <laughs> uh, The Midnight Lover punched me in the groin, um, you know, some <laughs> professional stuff too, but I mean, yeah, mostly well. uh, mostly stuff like that. You can check that out on, on the Tube of You. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, Joe Dombrowski PR at gmail.com. I know you're very happy that I, I finally made it to Gmail and I finally made it to Skype and I'm using the 2005 webcam and I'm just, man, I, I anytime I do something that wasn't around in the nineties, I feel so accomplished. I'm so, so proud. You, you've learned so much, uh, uh, hanging with me about production and, and I learned about lavaliers and, and then like, <laughs> I'll talk to Mike Moran and he'll talk about like XLR cables. And I don't know what that is. I'm just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then just smile and nod nicely and, and then look it up later. But you know, I, I, I just get paid to talk. You know, yeah. you people put some sophisticated looking equipment in front of me and, and I do the talkie talkie and then I go home and sleep. I don't have to think. So whatever. But I, I thank you guys for letting me, uh, 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 partake in this experiment. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy you guys are branching out. Uh, you guys, you're doing more spinoffs than all in the family. And yes, that's a 1970s pop culture Ooh. reference on a 2014 podcast. Yeah, Amy's right um, Amy not going to know anything about that. I know vaguely about uh, all in the family. Nope. But yeah. Oh, I'm going to send him some DVDs then. I can I get tell you I've been hanging with Matt Stryker with those age references. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, I was outdated long before I met Matt Strike. That's true. That's true. There you go. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, actually, Eamon, uh, tell us about you had a great experience, of course, uh, with Inspire Pro Wrestling. Actually, with uh, Joe, some some familiar names that uh, you and I have yeah. worked with in the past. Yeah, uh, I'll mention that we and. We mentioned uh, writers earlier. Uh, I can officially check off my bucket list for the weirdest thing I've had ever had to do working for a wrestling show, which is print out 42 black and white photos of Katy Perry uh, to fill Gary J's writer, uh, to fill his uh, personal locker room for the evening, uh, which that was fun and took a lot of time and effort. And they eventually got thrown on the floor and covered in beer, and that's sad. But uh, No, but it was a fun time. Um, we had uh, Inspire Pro's Ecstasy of Gold event uh, this past Sunday. Um, it was a, it was a very interesting experience, a big learning experience for me. Uh, like you mentioned, um, uh, I saw a lot of new faces, a lot of people I really liked. One of those new faces being a guy that Sorg knows, Joe knows, uh, one Shane Taylor, who recently moved down to Houston uh, from Pittsburgh uh, to sort of get um, sort of a different uh, environment uh, behind him. Uh, it was very cool meeting him. Uh, it was Almost, it was a surprise that he was going to be at that show for me. So it was a very cool game to meet him and getting to uh, see him work. And uh, uh, he is the newest member of uh, the uh, one of the hottest tag teams in Inspire Pro, the Pump Patrol. Uh, so uh, uh, Jared Wayne and AJ Summers will be looking to uh, get uh, Shane Taylor a little bit more spelt, I think the word is. Um, so that should be very interesting. Um, it was a really humbling experience. Um, for those that don't know, working on that show, uh, guys like Chris Hero, um, who had quite possibly a fin- the in all definitions a phenomenal match with Ray Death Row, um, that was one of the most it sort of that you uh, people talk about like that big moment that like when you're working for a wrestling promotion that sort of like captivates you and it's almost like euphoric. And I think for me, it was seeing the entire crowd just rise in adulation to the finish of that match um, was the coolest thing I've ever experienced. Um, it was amazing. Um, I got to call, uh, so I got to call the show or go ahead. I didn't say anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard something. It's okay. Um, I, I called a lot of the show with different people, actually. Uh, uh, my regular broadca- broadcast colleague, Rachel Summerlin, wasn't available that night. Uh, so I got to call a couple matches with ACH, which was super fun uh, and crazy and a whole new um, new uh, adventure for me because it was much different from what I was used to. Um, but it was fun, I, and I love I liked the work we put out there. I did commentary with Biss, um, who did commentary all throughout the uh, his time in ACW and he's basically hired me to do his job now and to get to work with him was amazing. And just, just to sort of play off of him and just 
see from that perspective. It was so fun. Um, we, I got to work, uh, like working in a locker room with, a. Uh, Takai Watanabe from New Japan Pro Wrestling was insane. Um, very nice man, and it was so humbling just to work with somebody, um, to work with an international talent like that. Um, even though the you know the minor stuff that uh, I talked to him to sort of go over like basics for the show was phenomenal. Um, it, w- it was a real learning experience. Um, it was a fun show. Uh, we had a great crowd. Um, our biggest crowd yet. We actually ran out of chairs, which is always a good sign. Yep. Um, and it was just fun. It was just a fun time. And I learned a lot. Um, and I got a lot of really great compliments from people. Um, I, th- um, there was the f- one show where, um, it was f- from since our first event, uh, where I was nervous and, um, I wasn't personally happy with my performance in the first half. And I, told that to some people and i was just because i just didn't feel happy with my performance personally i don't know what i don't know if it was nerves i don't know if it was what and then second half on i just i felt like i had to kick it in or something and i was very happy with everything we produced and i got some great compliments um uh ach actually told me that uh he thought he thought i sounded a lot like bryce remsberg in the best way which is a huge compliment for me because i look up to bryce's commentary so much i think he's one of the He's one of my favorite commentators uh, when he does his work uh, for uh, Now That You'll Fade It, uh, Chikara. Um, and it was just a, um, just a fun learning experience. And it it made me sort of give me a realization of one of the reasons why I wanted to like do the spinoff podcast was to talk about why I think there's an appeal to indie wrestling. Um, I think – and doing some of my jobs out of the show and seeing – a lot of like the young talent, just like talking with Chris hero and sort of like just soaking up the knowledge that he had to offer was amazing. Uh, I was sitting, um, from where we had commentary, ACH was right behind us, um, talking with two, uh, young training students who about like what was happening in the ring and why this was good and why, uh, they should have done this or why the crowd is into this or whatever. And it's, it was just, it's, I think that's the reason, um, I think the reason people gravitate, I think, toward dependent wrestling is not necessarily because it's the best. If you're looking for the best, I think you go to the WWE right now. I think you're looking for independent wrestling because you want to see people grow. And you see people um, and their willingness to learn and their willingness to get better. Um, and so when you can look five years you know, from when you first saw that person and say, wow, I remember when you were just this young kid and now look at you now. Mm. I think that's the appeal to indie wrestling. And I think that's what it's all about. And, um, I've hopefully, and I'm hoping in, in five years, inspire pro will still be around and we'll still be able to talk about stories like this and, Mm. and, and share stories about these guys. And, um, I think I was very happy with how the show came together and I'm very happy for everything that we're going to be producing. Um, just a bit of plug information. Our next event is February 16th back at the Marquesa hall in theater. We already have one match announced. Uh, ACH will be uh, making his in-ring return to inspire pro taking on one Sammy Guevara, who I believe Sorg seen and uh, Joe, you've seen as well. Russell for uh, IWC. I'm a a big fan of, of Sammy Guevara. Um, and only 20 years old to be as athletic as he is, mm-hmm. um, blew me away at proving ground with this match with Vassad. And, and I think, um, he, he's somebody that both myself and, uh, Zima Ion have kind of taken under our mental wing and have been trying to kind of put in the right direction. Uh, cause there's so much raw talent there that just needs direction. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm the best ever. Why? Well, because I'm the best ever, and I'm saying I'm the best ever. It's it's so trite, and actually, even I don't know if anybody read Andrew Goldstein's, uh, the ex WWE writer, is is top pet peeves in wrestling. That's one of them. Um, mm. Tell me a story. You know, uh, he talks great. He just has nothing to say. You know, um, yeah. Build on that, and you got something there, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of Sammy Guevara, and mm-hmm. I'll add to your point about what the appeal of independent wrestling. Um, to me, the appeal of independent wrestling comes down to two words, uh, heart and passion, because Mm -hmm. WWE, you'll see the best production, but you go to the indies, you'll find the guys that 
want to be part of the best production and they'll do right. whatever it takes to show you that. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's where you find, you know, it, it's cool to be in MetLife Stadium and, and, and be amongst 70,000 people, but to be right there, you know, five feet away from one of the most amazing athletic exhibitions you've ever, excuse me, you've ever seen, um, you know, thinking back to myself in July of 02 and what I felt watching, you know, seeing Cole Cabana for the first time and that kind of thing. Nothing compares to that feeling. You, 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 you're you immersed in it. You're a part of it when you go to independent wrestling. It's a completely different feeling. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I definitely agree. So, yeah, that's um, that's what happened this weekend for me. And that's awesome. uh, So if you definitely want to check us out, go to InspireProWrestling.com. You can get tickets for our February 16th event. And uh, just follow us everywhere. I, you know, just uh, follow up. How many shows have you done with them? Currently, uh, this was our fourth show. Fourth, fourth show. show. Okay. Um, All right. Started started back in July. So, and we're hopefully picking up some speed now. Yeah. And I think we're gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, so, from the stuff I've seen, and I haven't watched it. There's actually a full episode uh, that's up there uh, mm-hmm. uh, on our YouTube. I haven't watched through it, but the clips I've seen, the pictures I've seen, it, it looks like like I feel like uh, Joe. You know, with with, with Prime IWC, it always felt like every time you saw a clip, saw something, you saw like it looks. It looked like it was more than just an indie, you know, like there was some production, there was some look to it. Um, I think these guys in Inspire, uh, everything I see come out of them just looks slick, you know, now that they got the video thing figured out, I, I'm really looking forward to see where they go from mm. this. So, um, all right. So let's take a look at a little bit of wrestling stuff that, and we're trying to, I know we kind of fell into the trap of, uh, really kind of talking about the same things, whether it be, uh, in Texas frame and, uh, in Pittsburgh for us up here, um, so we're really kind of looking at the list, uh, 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 Nate Stein, uh, I always get these emails, I'm on a spelling list, where we get every, it has to be every indie wrestling show, like, in the U.S. Probably. At least a good majority. Yeah. So, so, I, I know, we're, we're under there as insider pro wrestling. Oh, well, I mean, we should probably contact, contact him, him and, and fix that. Correct that. But, uh, but <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, so we're going to try to take a look at that. And, and of course, the ones that we know and we love, we're going to, of course, talk about. But find some interesting things uh, aside from that. They're also coming up to talk about uh, to say, hey, go check this out. Maybe it's interesting. Uh, the big thing for us is, is there something online? If you're an indie show and you don't have anything on YouTube, you're not selling DVDs, anything like that. We're probably not going to talk about you. Um, hmm. I mean, it just, you know, we are. We encourage people to go to those shows. We encourage absolutely people to because... go to those shows. Uh, but but if, especially for the broad audience we're trying to cover here, um, it doesn't help us to say, hey, go to a show in Wyoming. Uh, <laughs> what, what's that going to do for you, you know? Um, so, Come on. You know our Wyoming demographic is large. Know, so. You know. so let's kick it off. Uh, of course, uh, uh, upcoming this week. Uh, uh, is RWA uh, lo- uh, RWA Pro Wrestling uh, in West Newton, PA? Uh, of course, we do DVDs here. You know, full disclosure here with Sorgatron Media and everything. Um, they're actually the sixth anniversary show for these guys. I can't believe they're 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 still around. I didn't think there was a room in Pittsburgh for an extra uh, group when they started up here. Uh, but they're they're going. Um, of course, headlined a uh, 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 former WCW star Lodi is going to be there against uh, uh, a big Pittsburgh guy, Ashton Amherst. Um, just really good to see them around. And somebody I know, Joe, you're familiar with Super Oprah. <laughs> I'm all too familiar with Super Oprah. Um, and I've seen more of Super Oprah than I care to recall. <laughs> uh, from from her ever-present bloomers that are normally uh, uh, wedged tightly in a very sensitive region to her makeshift cleavage that usually ends up... Uh, uh, in the form of uh, paper towels that fall out of her top. Um, Super Oprah is, is one of my most uh, definitive memories of working uh, uh, a number of shows in Ohio. So um, if, if you uh, buy a ticket to see Super Oprah, it is an experience you will not forget, uh, <laughs> even after extensive therapy. And this is, this is a small kind of in-the-hills town here in the greater Pittsburgh area, uh, 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 kind of out, it's a, it's a good, pretty good hour to get out there. Uh, I know it was a trip, uh, uh, seeing everybody's reaction when she first was out there. Of course, I've seen her in IWC and, uh, video with, uh, you know, like I said, in Ohio, uh, go check out the YouTube channel. Uh, we have some old matches up there so you can go check out exactly what they're all about. 
great. Love the crowd. Uh, it's one of those crowds that are still into it. Uh, like, into it, into it. You know, this isn't like an indie crowd. Like, you're probably going to inspire to come to IWC shows, point to your prime wrestling. This is, they're here for wrestling. This is their WrestleMania in a small town. I'm actually amazed. There's actually some people that, that do drive, like, several hours for the show uh, I've been hearing about. Uh, and it's really cool that they're, they're getting that kind of traction there. Uh, so definitely encourage that. Uh, let's let's do a swap out here. Eamon, let me know uh, uh, your next one here. I have an interesting one that's coming up. Um, uh, one of my pers- one of the areas of the United States where I think indie wrestling is really prospering, I think now and that I've become very interested in is the Midwest, actually. Uh, and there's a couple shows happening in the Midwest. One of them I want to talk about uh, is for St. Louis Anarchy. They're holding their benefit back. Uh, and this is a benefit show uh, for uh, uh, the family of Brian and Lori Davis. Um, the Davises, uh, basically, they had a house fire where they lost everything, uh, including, sadly, uh, their uh, seven-year-old son. Uh, so St. Louis Anarchy is holding this benefit show to um, basically raise money for this family and, and give them some support and give them some love. Uh, and it's at the Knights of Columbus in Alton, Illinois, on January 10th, which is this Friday. Uh so and it's a really great card. You've got um, the main event is the St. Louis Anarchy champion uh, Gerald James or Gary J, uh, who who we've had on the May- Mayhem show before, teaming with Jeremy Wyatt to take on Davey Vega and Matt Fidget. Uh, lots of big names. Michael Elgin will be there to take on Jojo Bravo, who, in my opinion, is one of the top rising stars in the Midwest that I think everyone needs to keep their eyes on. From Texas, recently moved to St. Louis, and he's been making a big, big uh, rise up there. Uh, ACH is taking on the St. Louis Anarchy debut. B-Boy, uh, which should be very interesting. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly, uh, tons of really great talent, uh, and th- the best talent, I think, in the Midwest, uh, which is being really prosperous, I think, as far as sort of a talent pool has been going. Um, so if you want uh, more information, you can go to slawrestling.com. Uh, tickets are $10, and it's uh, first come, first serve. Doors open at 6.30, and the show starts at 7. So go support them, both because it's great wrestling, a lot of great talent, uh, and some of the top talent in the United States, but also because it helps a really great cause um, and it could help really benefit this family. So go support um, St. Louis Anarchy. Excellent. I got uh, one. Uh, this is not one that has a lot, they have a little bit online, but it, it's kind of an interesting subject matter here. Um, <laughs> and I've heard about these. I've heard about these like ages ago. I think I've heard about the first one of these in the 90s. Uh, but if you go to ChristianWrestling.com, it, it, it's a Christian you know, church-based uh, uh, wrestling promotion, basically. Um, pretty slick promotion, although, uh, judging by the way they do this, I think they film everything with an iPhone, because it's all this, like, vertical thing going on. Um, and there's actually, they, hmm. they had a great news story uh, uh, locally, it looks like, uh, with these guys. And it looks like this isn't just a bunch of, like, T-shirt weekend warrior guys. Like, they look like guys that are that are wrestlers, which, you know, for a promotion you never heard of, sometimes you think it's going to be you know, a bunch of, you know, kind of overweight guys that you'd never imagine seeing in the WWE or something, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I've always been fascinated by this concept. I like to hear you guys' uh, thoughts on it, too. Uh, you know, always growing up, you know, before we had our gray area, stone cold ECW eras, it was always good versus evil, right? It was always good guy, bad guy. That's the pretty basic wrestling story. And I and, and some people say, oh, Christian wrestling, that seems so weird. It's violence, et cetera, et cetera. One, read the Bible. It's violent. Uh, two, <laughs> come on, you know, uh, a passion of Christ. Holy crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, two, I think it's a perfect stage to tell good versus evil stories, you know, and in the, you know, the church, you know, message uh, in this case, uh, I think it's a perfect fit for this. Now, they're having a show here, of course. Um, actually, I think it's tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Uh, not much notice there uh, in uh, Texas. Uh, Saint, am I seeing this right? Uh, Rockwell, Texas? Yeah, Rockwell, Yeah, I'm Texas. not sure if that's anywhere close to where I am, which is interesting. Like, I, and I think that's a cool thing with this. I'm, like, looking at the roster page, and I don't recognize a lot of these guys. But, I mean, like you said, they look like very competent, like, pro wrestlers. Oh, yeah. I recognize, like, uh, Caprice Coleman, though, from Ring of Honor. Okay. And that's interesting. But, like, I, like as far as, like, Texas names, I don't recognize a lot. And I've seen... Which is interesting. And and, 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 and I've seen, you know, wrestling in church. We actually... I've done uh, uh, the DBI, uh, uh, you know, in, in Ohio, uh, where it, it, it's actually... the. Twice now, I filmed wrestling in a church for one thing, but it's a it's a drug and alcohol awareness kind of thing for for a kid that you know 
uh, unfortunately passed uh, due to due to addiction. Um, so I think this really kind of fits that. I, I like seeing this. I like I like seeing different stuff. You know, we talk about Chikara a lot back on the Wrestling Mayhem show. Uh, we talked about you know some. I'd like to get back to talking about uh, Square Circle review that uh, you and I experienced, Joe, here in the future. Um, but uh, but I like these kind of uh, off concepts. Uh, Joe, do you have any opinion on on Christian wrestling? Um, I think it works. I think um, uh, you, you'd be shocked at how many people in wrestling are, 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 are you know pretty deeply religious. You mentioned mm-hmm. Caprice Coleman, who I know is an ordained minister. Oh wow! Um, you know, uh, uh, Nate Matson, I know is very religious. Yeah. Uh, Gunner and TNA is very religious. So there's there's definitely um, a lot of people who've been able to kind of uh, uh, balance church and ring, so to speak. Um, on the surface, I could see where people might say, oh, wrestling, that's, that's too immoral. But the Bible is one of the most, um, let me pick my words very carefully. <laughs> Welcome to the first and last Indian show. <laughs> the Bible's morality plays, um, Take you through a lot of some a lot of pretty heavy stuff to get to their point. Um, a lot heavier than you'll find in wrestling. Um, so I think uh, to the more learned individual, I think wrestling's a perfect place to have to, to, to execute that violence and that conflict and that struggle um, in a safe and 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 family friendly way. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Vince Russo had run a series of Christian wrestling shows uh, called Ring of Glory down in Georgia uh, uh, some years ago, I think in between TNA runs. Um, And he cast uh, uh, Sinister Minister Jim Mitchell to play the devil. Uh, So, I mean, how more... If you're you're going to get anyone, you know. Yeah. He is, like, born to play that role. It's amazing. Avon, you got one more here. I do have one more from a company that... Uh, is a lot what a lot of people would say is a company that really defined independent wrestling and made it popularized and um, sort of gave it a lot of life. Um, and they've been on their ups and turns, but uh, they're uh, apparently back in full force. And that's IWA Mid South. Um, they're doing an event in Clarksville, Indiana, this Saturday, January 11th, entitled Out with the Old, In with the New. It's an interesting uh, looking event, uh, very interesting looking card. Uh, main eventing uh, with Drake Younger taking on Eddie Kingston, which should be a very hard hitting uh, contest, very uh, intense battle. Um, speaking of hard hitting, speaking of intense, and, and really the reason why I think you should go to this show, and the one of the reasons I was intrigued by it, uh, one of the uh, featured matches. Uh, Gary J, who I'm a big fan of, uh, will be going one on one for the first time with the Necro Butcher, um, and that should be very fun because obviously a lot of people know who the Necro Butcher is, and I think Gary J is underrated as quite possibly one of the hardest hitters in wrestling and one of the like toughest nails, just competitors. Um, great character, great gimmick, um, just very entertaining, and goes, I think, a very um, uh, un- goes very underrated. Um, so this is a big match for him, and I encourage you to uh, anyone to go see that. There's also a lot of interesting matches. I believe uh, Jonathan Gresham will be taking on B.J. Whitmer, uh, Christian Rose, who's a big breakout in the Midwest, uh, taking on B-Boy. Um, there should be a lot of interesting talent on that show. Awesome. Um, so, oh, go ahead, sir. Oh, go ahead. I uh, just going to say, uh, it's in Clarksville, Indiana at the Colgate Gym. Uh, bell time is 7.35. Uh, doors open at 6.35. Floor seats, 15. GA, $10. And kids are 7. Um, and, yeah, if you want to go uh, check them out, go find, uh, go look up IWA Mid-South. Cause I, I, there seems to be making a bit of a resurgence, um, which is good. Because, you know, they created a lot of buzz for independent wrestling back in the early 2000s and sort of mid 2000s even. Um, and they were a big sort of um, company that made independent wrestling a thing. And so I think it's cool that they're coming back and, and looking to bust out some good stuff. So definitely go support them. If uh, you have anything to do in the Indiana area on the, uh, this Saturday. All righty. And with that, thanks again, Joe Dabrowski join us on our first episode here. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you guys for having me, and 
Uh, you know, there's so much we didn't even get a chance to talk about that we'd love to get into. PWX, Remix Pro, I just did Extreme Rising, so hopefully we'll do this again. Absolutely, uh, we'd love to have you back. Hopefully your boy Eamon gets me booked in Texas so I can talk about stuff down there. Yeah, you I can teach sure. anything or two. <laughs> we'll we'll do, man. It's fine. There you go. There you go. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. All right. Thanks, Eamon. He's at Eamon2, please, on the Twitters. I'm at Sorgatron. Let us know your thoughts on indie wrestling. And, of course, at Mayhem Show. WrestlingMayhemShow.com for all this stuff. Good times at WrestlingMayhemShow.com and all the other stuff. Uh, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Ro uh, sorry, Stitcher. Uh, iTunes, all that stuff will be up on everything. Uh, and of course, we're going to try to get these going 11 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, Tuesdays at live.sorgatronmedia.com. So we'll see you guys next time on the Indie Man. Never said I was a gangster, a thug, but I'm an animal. Peanut for the taste of the poor.